Okay, I'm going to talk to you about the Lake Auto Service um, tonight, and I got a little feedback during my presentation, so I wanted to start with something that uh, some of my classmates would recognize from Shark Tank. Um, so the rest of you, if it's lost, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, want to fix a <laughs> Okay, well, just to get started, I want to show you a picture. Do you want to know what that is? First of all, does anyone know what anything <coughs> is? And specifically, what the thing, the yellow line points to? Spark plug. I heard spark plug. Oxygen sensor. Oxygen sensor. What would you say, Michael? Air intake. Air intake. Air intake. Okay. Oxygen sensor is right. Well done. Okay, that is where this story begins. <coughs> um, I, I drive a, a, a 10 year old car, and about um, <laughs> about a year and a half ago, I needed to replace an O2 sensor on my car. I grew up the son of a mechanic, so I troubleshoot, diagnose what's wrong with my car before I take it anywhere. And I figure out can I fix it myself, and do I want to fix it myself? So I did that. I found out what was wrong. My car's kind of a pain to actually do that um, because of the location of where, where the O2 sensor is. So I called around and got a few quotes over the phone, looked up the price of the part at the local parts store. Burnett Automotive, $270 to replace one O2 sensor. That's a $60 part that arrives. Okay, Firestone, a little bit better, $240. A local mechanic just down the street $150. <coughs> okay. Um, I guess who gets my business? The guy for $150. Shop looks a little different than the other two. You get treated a little bit different when you walk in. Money talk, right? Okay, so that, that's, like I said, that's where the story begins. Um, so I kind of figure out, okay, what's he doing? He's been here a while. I think he's making money. Um, he's supporting a family. I know that much. I know he drives an okay vehicle. And I got to know him a little bit. I took I took my car back and had the air conditioner work on. I took my car's my wife's car and had the brakes done. So I had a few more things done. I built a relationship with him. I learned, hey, you know what he's doing from a mechanic standpoint. I found that he's a certified mechanic. Um, I found out how can I make money with this guy? How can I help him grow his business? And how can I make money too? Um, so that's kind of what the rest of this presentation is about: is how I can work with him to grow this business. And then where can we go from there? Um, so let's get started. The value proposition, you already have a good idea of what that's about. Um, certified repair for less. By certified repair, I mean ASE certified mechanics. These, are, these mechanics get the same certification that the guys that even your Lathe Ford dealer, all of your dealerships have the same certification. Burnett Automotive, Firestone, all the places have the same certification of what this mechanic and his lead technician have. Warranty. Some people care about warranty, some don't. Same warranty. All the parts that you get have a pass through warranty from the manufacturer. That's what you get at dealerships also. Um, and then labor comes with a one year warranty also. That's the same thing you get everywhere else. Okay, so we're getting the same level of service for less money. Uh, the proposition is pretty clear. <coughs> Modified billing structure, how does he do it? I, I spent some time with him a few weeks ago, a couple hours actually. Learning more about his business. How does he how does he bill it? How does he structure his costs? What does he do? Um, it was an interesting conversation because um, he didn't know a lot of it, and we had to work together to figure out what he was doing. But first of all, his hourly rates are significantly less uh, than what the other shops charge. He, he charges about seventy dollars an hour versus eighty-five for a local repair shop versus about a hundred for a, for a dealership. So very different um, billing. Rate. In addition to that, he um, he charges uh, a different quantity of hours per repair job than what a different repair shop will, will charge. He will charge, and I've talked a little bit to the class about this before. He'll charge, it's called book time, and he charges that. I didn't understand that before, I do now. He'll charge if a, there's a book you look up and it says this repair should take two hours, he'll charge two hours for it. However, what other repair shops do is they'll add a multiplier on top of that to contribute toward unforeseen events to 
contribute toward overhead, in my opinion, to contribute toward profit. Second thing is parts. You don't have to use you don't have to use OEM parts or original equipment manufacturer parts. You can use part from Riley's. You can choose the level of part you want. You can buy a sixty dollar part. You can use the hundred and twenty dollar part that um, that the other part repair stores were trying to sell. You have more options there. Let's talk about marketing strategy. The current market. Who's he currently selling to? These low income households in LA. Uh, by low income, generally the household income is well under fifty thousand dollars. Household, um, and then they're all walk-ins. Ninety percent of the business is walk-in business. It's just, oh, I saw your sign. I need a repair. Here I am. You're the closest one. That's how we use business. No advertising. That's it. Future market. Where do we want to go? We're going to keep that low income market. We're making money there. That's a good place to be. We're going to keep that. However, our growth strategy needs to include this middle income household. By middle income, I mean household between 50,000 and 100,000. And the reason for this, there's a high density of those households in this geographic region. So they're close, and they're interested in saving $90 on a repair service or $40 on a repair service. If we go four miles east, those household incomes are $150,000 to $200,000. They're not going to drive four miles to save forty dollars. We don't care about them. We're leaving them out. That's our marketing strategy. Financial impact. Okay, if you want to pass the handout down, here's a summary of the top lines and bottom line. Red line is revenue. Blue line is net income. You'll notice I have two thousand and eleven. That is based on an actual two thousand and eleven number both top line and bottom line. I filled in what's in the middle. So those are based on reasonable assumptions for labor, based on what he told me he pays his people and the number of hours they work and, and how he has his labor agreement structured. Um, but the top line and bottom line 2011 are actuals. 2012, how, how I started generating those numbers was through hourly rates, because that, that's how we generate the profit, is through hourly rates. We're not gonna make, we're not gonna get rich selling parts. That's not the idea. So profit margin on parts is very small. It's under under 20% really. Um, they get, I, I'm trying to scale up the, the markup on parts. It starts out at about 15% and works up to about 18% in three years. So profit margin on parts is very low. Um, but on labor is where the profit is. So the financial impact. You'll notice in 2013 we take a dip in profitability, even with a slight increase in revenue. The reason for this, right now, his employees are subcontractors, by definition, so they're not full-time employees. This is not legal. Um, county has a structure, in my opinion. So these employees need to transition to be full-time employees with this kind of payroll tax, insurance, all these expenses. So what we're going to do is we're going to transition those employees to be full-time employees, but also get them out of being a full-time technician, literally a technician, into being more of an administrator. I, I see those tendencies in them to be able to run the company at that level if you can get out of current goals. Um, so you'll see as a salary on the administrative side start to scale and improve. Um, starting in 2012, a little more 2013, just a little more 2014. So you'll see that administrative cost start to scale up a little bit too. Okay. Scalability. Where are we going to go? This is a Really a three-bay shop, the third bay needs to go away. It's in the office, um, so it's really a two-bay shop. So that means two places where you can actually work on cars, have car lifts, where you can lift the car up in the air and work on your company. Three options. The franchise has said no to two. I don't think that's a good option for this. There, the barrier to entry for a mechanic to start his own shop is way too low. He's not gonna start for, he's not gonna pay a franchise fee to learn what we have. And I think for us to set up the franchise structure based on what we discussed in class. So the next one is to set up a licensee situation. I think all the same rules apply. It's going to be the barrier for entry for um, a mechanic shop to start his own business is going to be too low for him to want to pay us a yearly fee to, to have what we have. The third option is the one that I think is the best option moving forward. And the idea here 
is I will have a separate LLC, my own company, that will invest in a lake of auto service. So I will own a part of this, and it will still operate as a freestanding business. And then once it's up and running, the techniques are proven and they operate well, I will find other small mechanic shops to invest in with this umbrella LLC and implement the same procedures. So this mechanic won't have any input into what I'm doing over here, but I'll still be able to apply some of the same procedures. So that's the idea behind ownership. Okay, um, next steps. So what do we do with this location? First you have to get billable hours up. Like I said, that's where we generate revenue, is billable hours. Right now, 2011 had about 25 billable hours per bay, per week. The goal is to get that to 40 hours per bay, per week. At $70 per hour, so that's where that revenue number comes from. And remember, you can have more billable hours than there are hours in the day. Theoretically, does that make sense? That's gonna be longer. What's that? Now skinny lawyer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so that, that's the goal with billable hours. We want to increase those. Because um, right now, some customers get turned away. They say, we're full right now. Can you come back next week? You can't have that. We have to be past that. Um, and the, the idea is to help schedule it out, get, get the technicians lined out on predictable schedules. Um, so advertising, we don't do any advertising at all. There are a couple of very Techniques right now. Um, everyone's seen Valpac. I get tons of mechanic coupons through Valpac. I've even gone to one because of Valpac. So that's a very easy way. Red Plum, it's another one's very similar. There are local um, news magazines like the Olathe News. Very easy to get into those. And it hits our target market just like that. And the, the third thing is the market shift. And this comes after the advertising. We want to start shifting that 90% low income to be more of a 50 50 split. Is that questions you have? What does shifting the market get you? A bigger customer base. Because right now, you know, like the, you have, and I'm thinking <coughs> geographically, in the south of Santa Fe, you have um, a large population of the city, but if you go from Santa Fe to, to Harold or 127, you greatly increase the number of homes at a higher income level. And so we have the opportunity, we don't want to increase our hourly rate per se, because that's our value proposition. We're concerned to the, the, the markets on parts and, and even the level of service that we do. Because the low income we're doing service on 10 to 15 year old vehicles, we'd like to get into some higher technology where you need more hours to work with. Why are they booking 25 hours a week in a day and turning people away saying that they're full? What's happening to the rest of the time? It's poor scheduling. When I was in, um, it took me a couple tries to get lunch with the owner. I took in lunch. So I went in one day and said, can I bring you lunch and have one and talk to you? That'd be great. <coughs> Not a day can you come back. Okay. No. Okay. So I was on my way one day, lunch in the car, and I said, I'm bringing lunch. It's today's it's today still works. When are you coming? I'm on my way. I'll be there in 10 minutes. Okay, that'll be fine. Um, he was the only guy there because the other two guys, they left. Because they don't have any job security. They're not employees. They're subcontractors. They don't have any benefits. They only get paid for the hours that they do also. So they don't have that ongoing incentive to be there. Five or eight to four. Um, so that, that billable hours is, is flexible. Did you consider leasing uh, repair space to those people instead of making them employed? I had not considered that. I, my concern, though, is how do you structure the. Uh, my concern is structuring the flow through the profit so that the same way a hair salon would work. Okay, I see I see how you structure. Sure. Each of the people cutting in a hair salon rents their chair. Right. In that situation though, they're responsible for their own marketing and which is largely the word of mouth. 
to my understanding, because like like the salon. The first the place I go to have my hair cut. <laughs> um, the person I go to, her the, the, the salon she works at doesn't do any advertising. She does her own. And what we're doing is we're taking on those administrative costs for right. advertising costs. So I see it being okay, how much we make it fair? And what if we want that fair? That's the question. Short question, how do you how do you retain the customers? How do you retain those customers? Um, how do you retain those customers that, that you did all these transactions and how do you get them back? How do you keep them loyal? What are you going to do to, to hold on to them? Our, our, our loyalty plan is tied to our value proposition. It's quality repair for the last month. It's the reason I have gone back. Um, a quick example, I had a, um, a ball joint replaced on my car. And I got home and I saw that it wasn't grease. So I called them and I said, I don't see any grease on this ball joint. And he explained to me immediately, you don't see any grease because there's not a zerg on this type of ball joint because it's new style. And he went through the entire explanation. And he still only charged me $80 for the entire so that That's how we retain customers through our value proposition. Certified all the uh, Two really quick comments. One is, you know, be careful when you take the owner.